You know, God has a plan for the new you. I say to you, God, uh, sometimes we think God is changing the plan. No, God has the overall plan. He's just letting us in on the plan as we go along. Because many times we think we have it planned out, how our experiences in life will bring us to a certain place, and suddenly everything changes. But God knew about that change that would come in our life before we knew it and planned to prepare us for that moment. Um, I want you to see this slide. Uh, Glenn and Sabrina, um, yeah, last Sunday they were with us at church. And we went to lunch together and had a really enjoyable lunch. And then he excused himself to go to the bathroom as we were all leaving. And um, I walked the others out to the car. I came back, talked to Sabrina. I felt led to do that and went to the restroom to check on him because he was taking too long. And he, had, he was in the restroom. He had, um, had a massive heart attack. The wait staff did everything they could. Um, the EMS was there. We got him to Scott and White, and he didn't make it. Um, and so you don't know how your life will change in a moment. You don't know what you think you have everything set, and then everything changes in a moment. And uh, we all expect to have time to a grasp and find out, but sometimes you just don't. But you look how God protected. Sabrina that morning was at home by herself. Wouldn't really know what to do. She said that herself. It could have happened here at church Sunday morning. Could have happened while they were driving to College Station. Could have happened in the middle of lunch or when they were driving home. But it was the safest place he could have been all day when it happened. Does it always happen? No, but it happened in this instance. And so God has plans, and he prepares things, and he has plans for all of us as we serve him. That's why Isaiah chapter 43, 19, he says, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. It's already happening. Don't you see it? The reason we don't always see it is because we're not paying attention. God is already planning and organizing things in our life, some changes. And we don't know when those will be. We, we call those guideposts. They happen unexpectedly, and there it is. And you have to be ready for them. One thing I can say after knowing Glenn very well, he was ready. He was saved. And the reason he named his company Second Mile Services is uh, because that way he would have the opportunity to witness. Because people say, well, what does Second Mile mean? Well, if Jesus told him if the soldier carries, tells you to carry his bag for one mile, which you're required to, you carry it too. So you don't do just what you're required to do, you do double. And sometimes we go, well, this is what I'm supposed to do, so I'm going to do it. And God says, that's fine. I want you to do double. Well, I don't want to do double. Yeah, but God says do double. And so you do it. And so he was consistent in his witness. And that's something for us to think about, being consistent in our witness and always be looking to take that second mile to help others. In Matthew 5, 33, you've heard the law says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, of course, during the course when Jesus said, they asked him, what's the greatest commandment? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. They weren't expecting that as the second greatest commandment. And all the law and the prophets hang on these two. And of course, they want to say, well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus told him the story of the Good Samaritan, who was the despised group in town, nobody liked in the area, and yet Jesus said, that's your neighbor. So we're told to love our neighbor and hate our enemy, but Jesus tells us, no, love your enemies. 
Pray for those who persecute you. You know, I hate to tell you this, but not everybody loves you. <laughs> Some people way really don't like you. That's okay. Pray for them. Retaliate no. When they do harm, send them a cake. That'll shake them up. Don't answer back the way they respond. And that turns everything upside down. Now we need to think about who our enemy, because we look at that person we don't like, they don't like us and all that stuff. You're looking at the wrong person. Because that's not the enemy. First, the enemy of new is fear. You know, anytime things change, what happens, we get kind of bristly. Our routine is different. We get aggravated. We don't know why, but we're aggravated because our routine's changed. You, you know, you, you tell your husband to go and buy the grocery store and pick up something, and he gets home, you go, where is it? Because he put it in automatic and just drove home. I mean... It's not that he was not listening or care or love you. It's just he put it in automatic and he got home safely to you. Just know that. That's what we do. But when you break the routine, well, then they might, you know, you might get in an accident. You might get lost. You might wind up at a store, you know, walk around. You know, walk around well, what, is that, what am I here for? So the enemy is the new. It's... It's fear. That's why 1 Peter 5, 8, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Hmm. So the enemy is not that person who doesn't like you for whatever reason. Just Sometimes people don't like you just because you exist, you realize that. The enemy is not them, it's Satan. And Satan knows prowling. If you've ever seen videos about when lions are hunting, they are real quiet when they're going, but they're very deliberate and know exactly what they're doing. They're not trying to hurt their prey, they want to eat their prey. Satan doesn't want to give you a hard time, he doesn't want to have a bad day, he wants to destroy you. And if you take your eyes off Jesus in the midst of a trial, you will get devoured. You must stay strong and keep your eyes on Jesus and keep your cool in the midst of a trial. So the devil wants to destroy you. You just know that. So don't look to that person. Look to who is behind it. It's the devil. But you need to know this. 1 John 4, 4. But you... Put your name there. Jim. Maxie. Even Marva. You can put your name there. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. The Holy Spirit lives within the believer. And he doesn't come and go. In the Old Testament, David was praying, don't let your spirit be taken away from me. But once Jesus told his disciples in John 14, I will come in, I'll make my home in you. You don't leave your home, you stay where it is. So when God comes into you in the power of the Holy Spirit, he doesn't leave you. Now, you may say, well, I don't feel the Spirit today. Yeah, because you've got him locked up in a corner. You're not letting him have complete rule of your life. But he's still there. He's still trying to direct you. He's trying to lead you. And he is within you. That's why you don't fear that roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Because greater is he, that's the Holy Spirit, that's within you than he, Satan, that's in the world. So you don't worry and fret and get all upset and wonder, is there any hope? Or you know, wonder around like somebody that doesn't have a father. You have a heavenly father who loves you, who cares for you, wants your best interest, and always is planning ahead for what you need long before you know it. 
in John 17, verse 14, in the great priestly prayer, before Jesus was to be taken captive, he's there on the Mount of Olives with the disciples. And they're trying to sleep, you know. Jesus says, we need a prayer meeting. They go, well, we've had dinner. We've had the Lord's Supper. Okay, it's time to go to sleep. Jesus says, no, it's time to pray. He says, I've given them your word. And the world hates them because they don't belong to the world. Just as I don't belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but, I'm, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They don't belong to this world any more than I do. Now let's look at this. Jesus says, I've imparted my word into those who believe in me. Satan is furious. Why? He doesn't want the world to know the truth. That your sins can be forgiven. That you are a child of God. That you're not just some blob that happened on this planet and you live and die, that's it. But the world hates them because they don't want to receive the message. It's blinded by Satan. Notice, Jesus says, I don't belong to this world. He said, I created it, but this is not my home. Home is heaven. We're passing through. It's very important. A lot of church people want to withdraw from the world. Oh, we don't, we don't want to be infected by the terribleness of the world, so we're going to retreat in our own little cubby hole over here. And we're going to be safe in our little surrounding place, but we're not going to venture out much in the world. Opposite. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. He says, I want you to be in the world, engaged in the world, being part of the world, being the light to the world. Remember, Jesus Christian, um, gave us the responsibility. He says, you are the light of the world. So when you go out into the world in these dark places, you are God's light. You are God's witness. You are to make the difference. That's why he sent you into the world, not to huddle up out of the world. The greatest mistake the church can make is retreat from the arena of the world. You've got to be there, otherwise you can never reach them for the good news. It will not happen. And I see that blind over there starting to blind me. If you could close that curtain over there, Jimmy, I'd appreciate it. It's hitting my eyes just so. Yes. There. Thank you, Jimmy. Now, just for a note, I'm the one that opened it earlier today. Let the light in. But we are the light of the world to take the light of Jesus to the world. So that's why we got to get out there and do events in our community so that people know that we care. So we're just passing through. The Bible calls us sojourners. This, you know, this is not our home. This is not our kingdom. Our kingdom is in heaven. I love my country. I'm glad that God placed me in the United States of America. But my allegiance is to my Savior, my Lord, my God. In Matthew 13, 38. The field, what is the world? And the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. That's us. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the harvesters are the angels. And just as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so at the end of the world. Now, last week I preached a whole message on planting seeds. How you plant seeds in your own life, and others plant seeds into your life. And the generations before you have planted seeds into you, and you're planting seeds in others. Well, you're supposed to be a good seed, making a difference in the world. Because what? You represent the kingdom of God. You represent your heavenly father. I I must say the last few years, I I met a a dear friend, her name is Deanne, and uh, she really impressed upon me to make sure I'll pray to our heavenly father. And the more as I looked through the New Testament, Jesus was always saying, 
I represent my Father. The Father has sent me, so I have sent you. And it makes it, it's one thing, God is kind of an abstract figure out there. You know, he's God we have there. It makes it much more real when we envision our Father. And so, you know, if there's somebody in the family you don't like, well, they're, he's your father too. Okay, they're father, so you got to be nice to them. They're your relative. They're your brother and sister, right? So we are people of the kingdom of God. Now, there's two diametric opposes. You have the wheat and the good crops, and you have weed. And in the parable, the evil one comes and sows the weeds. That's also referred to as tares, the wheat and the tares, in among the good seed. And they're growing together. Here's the problem. If you pull out the weeds early on, you damage the wheat. And sometimes we try to appoint ourselves as gardeners, and try to pick out, well, this one and that one and this one. They may not be real, but I think these are. God says, that's not your place. That's not your place. Your place is to be the light, share the light, cultivate what God has. Because who's going to do the separating? God's angels. And they're far more efficient than we could ever be. And they're going to separate from wheat and the tares. That's not your job. And sometimes we'll hear this public official, that public official saying stuff. We go, well, that's not a Christian. Well, you may be right, you may be wrong, but it's not your place. Because God is going to separate them. You don't know their heart, but he does. And remember this. We all, as Christians in America, we always think we're in the majority. Jesus called the church his little flock. And you like to think that, well, in America, most people are. Well, most people in America will claim that. But does that make them that? No. It's their faith in God that makes them that, that they've received Jesus as their Savior, they repented of sin, and they're adopted into God's family. And only God knows for sure. And he's the one that separates the wheat from the tares. So you better make sure you're part of the wheat. You, know, you, you don't know when your day will come. Uh, that was really put upon me this past Sunday. You just don't know. You can be a picture of health, everything going right, and then everything has changed in a moment. Second, enemy of the new is disobedience. See, God has big plans for you. And you say, well, I, got, I love those plans, God, but... I, I'm busy right now. I've got things to do, things to accomplish. I already have appointments. I've got my whole schedule filled. I, don't, I can't add anything more to my list, God. Hmm. 1 Peter 1.14 You must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You don't know any better then. See, when God gives you a responsibility, sometimes it'll come when you expect it. But I say to you, it normally happens when you least expect it. At the, and it always seems the most inopportune time. The time that you would never pick and God says, this is what you want to do. I'm just going to be a real brief on this. When God called me to preach, after three years, I'd finally gotten my business successful. I'd paid off everything, and everything was going to look rosy. I'm going to make all this money and do all this great in my business. And God says, fine, now sell it and serve me. And I said, yes. Because I'd learned through three years, I could trust him completely. And if that's what he wanted me to do, I was game on. Because I'd learned it was not about me, it was about him, and he was going to supply my needs, so my focus was on him. That's why Hebrews 12, 1. 
Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Hmm. Now, this is one of those mountaintop verses. And yes, we've looked at it. But let's look at it afresh now. Because that huge crowd of witnesses, those are, there's several groups of those. There's a whole group up in heaven. Those who've gone before us, they're looking down, seeing what we're up to. I don't know why they'd be interested in us down here because it's going to be so good in heaven, but they are witnessing to what we're doing. I guess that they can talk to us when we get there. Ah, I saw what you did. But see, a crowd of witnesses of faith. So you have those in heaven, but also those here on earth who are watching what you do, how you do it, how you set an example. And so they can encourage you to do that. Now, in order to live the life of faith, you have to strip off every weight that slows you down. Why? Because you're running a race of endurance, a long haul. And if you're going to go on the long haul, you can't be weighted down by all the things of this world. You've got to get rid of those so you can run God's race, not your race. See, we won't... It's interesting. We want our race where, okay, I'm going to go on a race, but I want a, a bus full of my stuff with a trailer behind it with the boat attached to it, and I'm going to run, but I want all this stuff following me. I've, um, as I've driven across the country sometimes, you'll see that actually happening. You'll see some people on their bicycles, and you go, what are they? And, of course, they don't look like they need to exercise. I mean, they're going on those bicycles, and... They're going along, but then you look behind them, and here comes a bus. <laughs> so they're exercising, doing all this, but they got all the comforts of the world right behind them. God says, I want you to strip off all those extra weights. I want you to get rid of all that and do whatever I've told you to do right now. You say, well, it's not convenient. It's not what I wanted. I had other plans. Be obedient children of God and do immediately what God calls you to do. Don't hesitate. The enemy of the new is disobedience. Further, and John 14, 15. If you love me, that's a big word, I-F, if, obey my commands, and I will ask the Father. Notice here it comes again, our Father. And he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it's not looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. So let's look at this a moment. See, if you love me, obey my commands, what? Then you get to ask your father. Give me the advocate. Give me the Holy Spirit. Notice, he leads you in all truth. Sometimes we go through this world and we go, what is truth? What's going on here? He says, I will lead you. And the foundation of our truth, of course, is in the Bible. We've got to start there reading that. But he will guide you in all truth so you know exactly what you're supposed to do and how. But sometimes you go, you talk to somebody about the Lord and you try to show them verses and they go, yeah, I, don't, I don't get it. And then you get disappointed because they don't comprehend what you comprehend from the Scripture. The world cannot receive him. It's not looking for him and doesn't recognize him. They don't get it. That's why with a non-believer, you always just start talking about Jesus. You don't chase other rabbits. Uh, Can God make a world something so big he can't pick it up? Well, you know, they they ask you questions that, you know, have no real basis to try to find the truth, just try to chase after rabbits. Focus on Jesus, what he's done. 
And somebody may say, well, yeah, but there's so much terribleness in the world. Yeah, because Satan and evil is in this world, and we're bringing the light of God to transform this world. So therefore, notice, he will never leave. You know what that's for a believer? That's very comforting for us. Because, you know, we're not uncertain. Are we accepted by God? Where are we loved by God? Or does God care for us? You know, I felt like I was loved yesterday, but I don't feel like love today. Don't let your feelings be the gauge of your life. Because some days you're on the mountain peak and next day you're at the bottom of the hill. What sustains you through all the ups and downs in life? The certainty that the Holy Spirit is within you. You've been adopted to God's family. Your sins are forgiven. You are home with God. And He will never depart from you. And so when your body wears out and they put it in the ground... That's just your tent. You have already gone to heaven and there to meet the others. And you become, with that great cloud of witnesses, setting the example for us back here. Three, the enemy of the new is comparison. Oh, we love to compare. Oh, I got more likes than your likes. I put more pictures up than your pictures. I got more shares than you. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? In John 21, verses 19 through 20, after Jesus said this, he said to Peter, follow me. What happened? See, Jesus had just told Peter, when you get old, People are going to lead you where you don't want to go. It's going to be not very good for you. So then Jesus told him to follow me. Turning his head, Peter saw the follower whom Jesus loved, that's John, following them. And Peter said, but Lord, what about this one? You know, what about John? You told me, what about him? Jesus said, if I want this one to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Follow me. The temptation is to look around and say, well, this, you know, this one's called to do that and that and the other, and they're not doing it. Why should I do it? They're not doing that. Or I've accomplished all this, I've done all this, you know, I'm, so I'm real great. But they haven't done as much as me, but they're even doing better. What about him? And we start comparing, maybe I'm better than this one or they're better than me and back and forth. He says, no comparison. Don't look around like that. Don't compare what you're doing to what somebody else. You be faithful what I've called you to do. You follow me whatever I want you to do. You know, this, um, you know, and sometimes it's the little things. This past week, I, God let me to do something, and I go, nah, I'm not going to do it. And a little bit, about an hour later, no, nah, do it. No, I... And finally, when I, when I only had just enough time to do it, I went ahead and did what God wanted me to do. And it's, it was a minor, very small things, but it was a matter of obedience, doing exactly what I was supposed to do to um, cheer a friend up. Because, but I fought that. But God said, do it. You don't know what little thing you might do for somebody else that will change the outlook on their life. Or it may just bring a smile to them for that moment. Be obedient in the little things, then God will have you doing greater things. But if you don't take care of the little things God gives you, you won't be ready when it's sometimes to do the bigger. Hmm. If you want me to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You Follow me. In Matthew 20, verse 10 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers in his vineyard. When they received their pay, they protested to the owner. 
You say, what? They worked all day, now they're protesting? Well, yeah. Hmm, comparison. Those people worked only one hour, and yet you paid them just as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching heat. He answered one of them, friend, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Should you be jealous because I'm kind to others? So those who are last will be first in, and those who are first will be last. See, so you've heard that expression, now you know where it came from. Some people were griping. So you never want to be a griper because he says, the ones that griped, they wound up last. So you need to be gracious and thankful for whatever God does for you. But isn't that like it is? They agree. But then they look around comparing, well, I had to do this, they didn't have to do that, so I ought to get more because of that. Don't compare yourself to others. What does God want you to do? And do it. Now what about friend? Friend of the new community. Friend of the new community. The new community is the church. In 1 John 4, 18, such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we're afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And that shows we have not fully experienced his perfect love. You know, when I was young, as I read through the Bible, I always looked through, you know, you get, if you don't do this, you get this punishment. And you, you know, if you do this, you get this punishment and so forth. The older I've gotten, the more I realize how much God's love is. Because if God was really angry and mad about all that all the time, well, he wouldn't have time to love me. And the more I draw near to him, the more I experience God's love and care, and the more I want to be like him, showing love and care to others around me. And so the more we love God, the more we love. And that's why when you have loved ones and friends who leave earlier than what you anticipated, it really leaves a huge void in your life because you love. And, you know, it's God fortunately sends the help we need to get us through those times. You know, it's, he's with us. And notice that not fully experience his perfect love. Now, we won't know that completely till we get to heaven. But the more we become like him and love like he expects us to, the more we will experience that and feel it. Uh, some of you in this place have taught me more about love than you could ever imagine. Your care, your wonder, your thoughtfulness is just off the chart. In 1 John 4, 11, Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other and God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us and God has given us his support as proof that we live in him, he in us. So we are to love one another. You know, love and you know, we always want to talk about feelings. Well, feelings are great, love. But you know what? You really show your love by what you do. How you treat others. How when, if somebody mistreats you, you still treat them nicely. Because you love. You love. And I love you in this place very deeply. In Ephesians 4.32, it also says... Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, 
forgiven each other, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. You know, it's so easy to find fault with other people because we're all sinners. And so it's easy to find failures and shortcomings in other people's lives. Each of us need to find common ground to build each other up. So it said, be kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving. You know what? You want to be forgiven of your sins? <laughs> forgive other people. I've heard people say, oh, I'll never forgive you. No, no, never say that. Forgive and move on. Let it roll off your back. Because you want your sins forgiven. So forgive others. You know, it was a very striking time. Uh, as you read in the Old Testament, the last fourth of Genesis is about Joseph. And how his brothers had sold him to slavery. And they did that because the honor and respect and the blessings they gave to Joseph, his father did. And they were jealous of Joseph. And then when... They came back and there was a feast and they were seated each one according to their birth order. And of course, they're going, what does this mean? <laughs> they know our birth order. And then they give Benjamin twice as much as all the others. And this time they showed no jealousy. Where before they sold their brother in slavery, this time they showed him the respect because they chose to. Second, friend of the new is humility. Humility. You know, the opposite of what the world expects in life. In Matthew 18, verse 3, Truly I say to you, unless you change and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, that's... That, Kind of a wake-up call. You say, what does he mean? Unless you humble yourself as a child and say, Father, I can't do it. See, we as men, we want to, you give me a responsibility, fine. You give me something to achieve, I'm going to go and achieve that. You want something done, I'm going to get it done. God says, yeah, but those are your successes. I want you to come as you are. With nothing in hand, but that you're coming by the faith of a child and say, I accepted Jesus as my Savior. Then he can build you up. You know, that was in the midst of the apostles. You know, the children came to see Jesus and they were trying to scurry him away. And Jesus said, no, if you keep one of these little ones from finding out me, it's better that a millstone will hung around your neck and you cast in the bottom of the sea. Let the children come to me. And James 4.10, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. So you humble yourself before God, then God raises you up before the others and says, look what this servant did. Look what my child done, has done. Isn't it so much better when God raises you up than you try to raise up yourself? Oh, we've all seen that. Somebody wanting to move up in this place and that place and leadership and so forth. And then they tumble on down all of a sudden. It's quite different when you're raised up to the position. God says, I want to lift you up. And a friend of the new is readiness. Readiness. You know, you never know what God has done to prepare you to help other people. I'm going to reference right back to you for just a minute about last Sunday. It would have been terrible for Sabrina if Glenn had died at home by her. That happened at home by her. She wouldn't know what to do. She told me that. I wouldn't know what to do. If it were up in the church, that would have been a negative thing for all. If he had been driving, what would have happened? There could have been an accident. 
but he was in the one, while we're in the restaurant, the one place where nobody else was negatively affected was there. And then God made sure I was there so that I went and found him instead of Sabrina finding her, find him by herself. You know, I just happened to be there. God said, go there, sit with Sam and Sabrina. You don't know what God has prepared for you to be and what he wants you to do for somebody else. Because it's not about you. When God chooses to use you, it's not about you at all. It's about him. Now, he wants you to be the blessing to someone else. So the world says, I want to be the blessing. No, God's the blessing. And God orders things in our lives to be at the right time. And we never know when that will be. So we always need to be ready and listen. In 2 Chronicles 6, 19, For the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth, so that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. The inference is God has to look through a whole lot of people on the earth to find those who are really sold out to him. And that means there's not many. But you know what? We that are those want many to join us and we want to make sure that they have an opportunity to have the same peace we have. But God's looking and searching. In Psalms 53, 2, God looks down from heaven on the entire human race. He looks to see if anyone is truly wise, if anyone seeks God. You know what? God knows our hearts. You know, some other people may ascribe your motives for this, that, and the other. Many of you in this room have taught me well. Don't worry what other people think. You've got to focus on what God thinks. And when your heart is right with God, you don't have to worry about the rest. Just let, let the chips fall where they may, because no matter what you do, other people will criticize you. Other people will say things. Just let it roll off. Just let it roll off. In Hebrews 11, verse 6. And it is impossible. Circle that word, impossible. It's impossible to please God without faith. See, if, you know, if you could figure out how to do everything and do things just right without God being in the middle of it, you, would not, you might have a lot of victories and so forth, but you'll miss out on the best things you can have. Because it's impossible to please God without faith. Faith is willing to take that risk, take that chance that nobody else would, and take that leap of faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So just know... Your Heavenly Father loves to give you presents. He loves to give you gifts. He loves for you to be a gift to somebody else and loves you to be their gift back. He wants us to bless one another, encourage one another, care for one another because you are the physical presence of God on this earth. And as you live that, you transform other people's lives. But it all begins by knowing Jesus as your Savior. So make sure you've done that because you don't know what day will be required of you. So you need to be ready today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your wonderful care. Now, we don't know what the events of life that will happen will come to us. We tend to always think death is a long way off. Death can come at any time. So help us to be ready and help us if there's a blessing we need to give that we do it today. If there's an encouragement we need to do, help us do it today. Help us not withhold blessings or withhold encouragement or withhold our love, but freely give it 
for we only have now. Tomorrow is not promised to anyone. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us stand for this invitation.